Come, O Holy Spirit. Come as holy fire and burn in us. Come as holy wind and cleanse us within. Come as holy light and lead us in darkness. Come as holy truth and dispel our ignorance. Come as holy power holy and power enable and our, weakness. our weakness. Come as holy life and dwell in us. Convict us, convert, convert us, us, consecrate us as we worship, as we together. worship together. In, in Jesus, Jesus' name, name. Amen. amen. I would say sing, but stay muted. And that help us. amazing love is this while we were sinners christ died for us because we have faith in him we dare to approach god with confidence trusting in god's grace let us confess our sin almighty god you alone are good and holy purify our lives and make us brave disciples we do not ask you to keep us safe but to keep us loyal so we may serve Jesus Christ who tempted in every way as we are was faithful to you from lack of reverence for truth and beauty from a calculating or sentimental mind from going along with mean and ugly things oh god oh god deliver us from artificial life and worship from all that is hollow and insincere O oh God, deliver us. Deliver us. From being dull, pompous, or rude, from putting down our neighbors, O oh God, oh deliver God, us. Deliver us. From cynicism about others, from intolerance or cruel indifference. O oh God, deliver us. From being satisfied with the way things are in the church or in the world from failing to share your indignation about injustice. Oh God, deliver us. From selfishness, self-indulgence, or self-pity. Oh God, deliver us. From token concern for the poor, 
for the lonely or loveless people, from confusing faith with good feeling or love with wanting to be loved. O oh God, deliver us. For everything in us that may hide your light. O oh God, forgive us. Amen. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, how good and pleasant it is to be with you this evening. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon. It is like the oil that rolled down Aaron's beard. For there on Mount Hermon, God ordained God's blessings forevermore. Uh, hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us uh, this evening from Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. And it reads this way. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We'll tag this uh, message uh, of help and hope uh, this evening with the thought further and deeper, further and deeper. In the 1850s, Henry Comstock left Canada and made his way to Western Nevada, hoping to strike it rich by prospecting for gold. While in Nevada, he gained the reputation of a shyster someone who was willing to do less than honorable things to get what he wanted. Moreover, many of his observers said he was too lazy to bake bread, preferring instead the easy flapjack, hence the nickname Pancake. After he had made a modest sum of money from gold prospecting, Henry Pancake Comstock sold his claim. The company to which he sold the claim later found on the land that he sold them a vein of silver worth tens of millions of dollars. We know this strike today as the Comstock Lode. Had he gone a little further, had he dug a little deeper, maybe Comstock would not have fallen into despair and depression that eventually caused him to take his own life. How many dreams have gone unrealized because we refuse to go a little, little further, to dig a little deeper? How many marriages have fallen apart because of our unwillingness to go a little further, to dig a little deeper? How many of us have graduated, as my grandmother would say, oh, laude, rather than cum laude, because we just couldn't muster the discipline to go a little further, to dig a little deeper? 
How many churches are fractured in crisis or decline because we fight tooth and nail against going a little further, digging a little deeper? The text opens with Jesus standing beside the Sea of Galilee, what Luke calls Lake Genesaret. John Dominic Croson argues, and I agree, that one reason we see so much of Jesus' ministry taking place in proximity to the Sea of Galilee is that King Herod had commercialized the lake, driving many local fishermen out of business. You see, Israel was a colony of Rome, and Herod was a puppet king. He was Caesar's crony. He was Jewish in name only. He exploited and, and oppressed his own people to carry favor with Rome. Although his onerous and inhumane taxation on the lake was driving his own people to destitution and desperation, he couldn't have cared less. It was the cost of doing business. Herod's economic policy was an ancient version of the trickle-down theory, a reverse Robin Hood, from the needy to the greedy. And this vicious policy caused unspeakable misery throughout the land, uprooting people from the land and therefore the ability to make a living in an agrarian society. Families were torn apart. Crime was rampant. Poverty and disease wreaked havoc. Many women had to resort to prostitution just to survive. Many young men took to banditry, a first century form of gang banging just to eke out an existence and a host of other social ills. The more I think about it, this would be an accurate description of the harsh reality of life for billions of God's children here and abroad in our day and time. So Jesus led a movement against this demonic and dehumanizing system. Jesus knew the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwells therein. The world belongs to God and not to Rome. And likewise, we must realize that the world belongs to God. It still belongs to God and not to Halliburton or Exxon or Texaco, not even the United States of America. The world belongs to God. So we find Jesus standing beside the Sea of Galilee with the crowds pressing in on him to hear the word of God. I like that. That each of muck raking and smear campaigns is good to know that somebody wants to hear the word of God. In this age where it seems like the whole country has an appetite for the malicious and sordid fare served up by people who will say or do anything to make a quick buck by ideologically rather than fact-driven media sources. I am delighted to know that somebody wants to hear the word of God, my sisters and my brothers. The crowds still want to hear the word of God. Maybe we need to check how or if we are actually communicating it. The message hasn't changed, but methodology and modalities must change to meet the challenges of this age of quantum change. Jesus saw two boats at the shore of the lake, and the fishermen uh, had gone out of them to wash their nets. And Jesus tells Simon Peter to put out a little way from the shore, away from the shore of comfort, away from the shore of complacency and convenience, away from the shoreline of tradition and the seven last words of the church. We've never done it that way before. We must leave terror Farmer, step out on faith and go further out into the deep water to let down our nets for a catch. God is calling us to go further in our prayer life, further in our Bible study, further in our pocketbooks, further in our creativity, further in our connectivity, further in our relationships, further in our faith and further in our witness and service. Stop messing around in the shallows of life. Venture boldly into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. For some of us, like Peter, we're retort, Master, we have labored all night long and have caught nothing. Does anybody here know anything about the night shift? When you labor all night long, 
And even when daybreak comes, all you have to show for it are the bitter tears of disappointment. When you prayed all night long and your situation seems to be worse than it was before you started praying. When you've given it your best shot and you still come up empty. I'm talking about working the night shift. But in spite of the disappointments and dejections of life, Jesus is calling us to launch out into the deep. This call is counterintuitive. It goes against the data and the evidence at hand. It very often makes no sense at all. But that is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot see what the end is going to be, but we know who is going to be with us to the end. There are no guarantees about results. There are many unknowns, many things we cannot see. It's dark in the deep. Howard Thurman recounts the story of a deep sea diver. In his classic book, Luminous Darkness, he talks about a diver who dives into the sea. And he, as he goes down, he goes past the belt of fishes and he gets to a point where there's total darkness. You can't even see your hand in front of your, your face. And your first uh, reaction is to, I need to get out of here, to get, get back to the light. I got to go back up. But he says, if you just hold on and hold out and not reflexively respond to the darkness, the darkness takes on a luminous quality. If we just be still and not give in to our fears, if we just hold on and not react to the darkness, the darkness takes on a luminous quality. We begin to see things in the dark that we never saw before. Reality opens up in a whole new way if we can just get beyond our fear, our fear of losing control, our fear of change, our fear of being challenged, our fear of walking by faith rather than by sight. God will turn the darkness into a delight. Part of the problem is that we have brought, we bought into the world's myth of scarcity rather than God's promise of abundance. God's economy works a little differently than Wall Street's economy. God says, try me in this. And see, won't I pour out a blessing that you won't have room enough to contain? God tells us, if you want to be first, you must be servant of all. If you want to be elevated, you have to humble yourself. If you want to be filled, you have to empty yourself. If you want to save your life, you have to give it up for Christ's sake. We are witnessing right before our very eyes the folly of me first, profit over people, capital over community thinking. Trickle down was nothing but a trick. A free press is only for those who own one and those who profess to prefer less government only want less government for everyday people, but as much government as possible for corporations. Dr. King had it right. Unless we learn how to live together as brothers and sisters, we will surely die tragically and separately as fools. In spite of Peter's reluctance and initial Hesitation, he says, something that should be the hallmark of any disciple. Yet, if you say so. Oh, I like that right there. Peter says, yet, if you say so. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yet, if you say so. I'm tired and I don't feel like going on. Yet, if you say so, Jesus. I don't believe I have the competence or the courage. Yet, if you say so. I feel like a failure yet, if you say so. And at the end of the day, it's not about fish. It's about faith. It's not about if we believe we will catch some fish. It's about our belief in Jesus. Relationship with and belief in the mission giver is necessary for carrying out the mission. And when Peter was obedient, he brought in a catch that was too big for him to handle. See, there's a relationship between obedience and abundance, between faithfulness and fruitfulness. But there's something else here that needs to be lifted up. Peter's encounter with Jesus leads to a sense of unworthiness and confession. Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Ah, shades and echoes of Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, that classic text that is used uh, to order worship in the reformed tradition. You know the passage, do you not? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord 
high and lifted up and then and the train of his robe filled the temple and there were two seraphs and they had six six wings uh with two they covered their feet and with two they covered their faces and with two uh, they flew and they called one to another holy 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 is the lord god of hosts ah and then isaiah said get away from me I, i'm a man of unclean lips and i come from a people of unclean lips and yet Mine eyes have seen the Lord, the God of hosts. And then a seraph flew uh, and took a live coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips, symbolizing his purification, symbolizing his cleansing. And now he was ready to receive the word. Who shall go for us? Who, whom shall we send? Here am I, send me. I'll go. I love the fact that Jesus doesn't beat Peter over the head with his sinfulness. He doesn't minimize it. He doesn't coddle it. He doesn't condone it. But neither does he use it to club Peter into a sense of worthlessness and uselessness. Too often the church has the regrettable distinction of being an institution that buries its wounded. Too often the church is so legalistic and so self-righteous that we forget that each and every one of us is a sinner saved by grace, that it, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, well, where would we be? No, when people are down, they need a lift and not a lecture. They need to be encouraged and not injured. The fact of the matter is that God is more concerned about where we are going than where we've been. God is more concerned about our future than our past. God is more concerned about who and what we can become than who and what we have been. So don't let shortcomings, frailties, and foibles present, prevent us from becoming and doing what God wants us to do. God wants to use us to catch people for the kingdom. The sense of that phrase, from now on, you will be catching people, is no longer will you be catching fish to die, but you will be catching people to live, to bring them to life, to bring them alive from dead thinking, dead behavior, dead habits, dead relationships, dead tradition, and a dead faith, to bring them alive from a dead culture and a system that can only kill, steal, and destroy, to bring them alive to a living hope and a living faith, a new walk, new walk and a new talk, a new way and a new day, a new reality and a new relationship, a reality that is defined by freedom, justice, and equality for all of God's children, a reality where the jobless are gainly, gainfully employed, the homeless are housed, the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, the ignorant are educated, the blind have their sight restored, the lame are made to walk, the sick are cared for, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest and God is glorified and God's people are edified throughout the earth. Jesus' person and pronouncement are so compelling that they left everything, boats, fish, nets, everything, and followed him. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's purpose in the name of Jesus. I want you to know this evening, beloved, that I am compelled by this man named Jesus. I am convinced about this man named Jesus. I am convicted by this man named Jesus. And I am satisfied with this man named Jesus. Beloved, softly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Come, follow me, and let's go further and deeper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Friends, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world, the world and, and the earth. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Our assembly this evening, offering this evening, will be given to the Synod's disaster assistance efforts. Uh, a link will be provided in the chat.
uh, or on the screen right now uh, so that you may contribute to the fund that helps folks throughout the Synod when hurricanes, tornadoes, or other disasters devastate congregations in our area. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in showing your love to the world through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us begin the installation. Please refer to fourth and twenty-eighth of the first Corinthians. So let me read first. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, there are but it is the same Lord who is served. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. To each is given the gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. God works through each person in a unique way, but it's God's purpose that is accomplished. Each is given a gift of the Spirit, the to, be used spirit for the common good. to be used for the common good. Next statement on installation, please. We are all called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's owned by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be displayed of Jesus Christ and servant of our servant, Lord. Within the community of the Church, some are called to particular service. Today, we install Pastor Chris Gilloggers as the 20. To moderator of Synod of the Sun, in answer to God's calling and the affirmation of the people of God within our life. In accordance with the constitution of the Presbyterian Church, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. First, first question, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Second 
Second question, do you accept scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Third question, do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable exposition of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead to the people of God? Fourth question, will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually by the confessions? Fifth question, will you be governed by our church's polity and will you be abide by its discipline? And will you work together Sixth question, in your daily life, will you be friend among your colleagues in ministry, wording with them subject to the ordering of God's word and the spirit? Once again, will you be in your life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, your neighbors and work for the reconciliation of the word? Do you, will you pray for the people and Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Now, I'd like to ask all of you. So, all the members, please answer. Do we agree to pray for Christy, encourage her to respect her decision, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? We do. we do. Do. Do we agree to pray for her? And we will continuously pray for her, encourage her to respect her decision and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. We do. We do. We do. We do. We do. Members of this assembled body who desire to affirm their support of Christy Rogers and the office to which she has been called are invited to come forward and lay hands upon her while we who are in our many places may raise your hand to the screen as we beseech God's blessing upon her and the work that is before her. Let us pray. Almighty and faithful God, in baptism you claim us and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of your calling. In every age, you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your loyal people. We thank you for leading Christy Rogers to this time and place and for calling her to serve you in Christ's church. Establish her in your truth. Guide her by your Holy Spirit and give her special gifts to do this special work so that in your service, she may grow in faith, hope, and love to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we... If I was there, I would get my oil and anoint you, but so we're just going to let the oil flow uh, virtually at this point.
Oh, we have somebody who's going to do that. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah. Christy Rogers, child of the covenant, as you were sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever in your baptism by the Holy Spirit, you are now set apart for this special calling and service. May you serve Christ and his glory forever. Amen. 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 Christy Rogers, you are installed to service as moderator in the Synod of the Sun. May the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man. I invite you to imagine with me the mighty deliverance of the sacrament, this table. This table reminds us what God has done to shelter those whom God has called leading them out of bondage and oppression, blessing them with an abundance of mercy and grace, guiding them through wildernesses and dangers. But this sacrament and this table not only remind us, they also open our eyes and our hearts to the moment in which we live. And they equip us for the challenges we face in a world of sound bites and political polarization with embittered hostilities and nursed grievances, we come to this table, a place of gathering and a moment of sacred peace. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossian faithful, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And to the Galatian faithful, he wrote, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, he was not dismissing the uniquenesses or our differences, ignoring them for the sake of a pseudo-peace, but he was calling all who are claimed by the Spirit of Christ to no longer use the differences as a source of suspicion, fear, and division. Indeed, in his letter to the Corinthian church, he illustrates the necessity of our differences as he compares the fellowship of believers to the human body with the many cooperating parts so that we can see that our differences are a demonstration of the imago Dei, celebrated and blessed, the image of God in which humanity is created. So this table points to the past, and reminds us of God's mighty act of deliverance, as well as opens our eyes and our hearts to the present, this moment in which we live. But it also points to the future. For John declared that it had been revealed to him that he saw a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The significance of this sacrament and this table, past, present, future, are here. This sacrament, this table, is an eternal moment held sacred for us to enter at any time as a sign of what community, fellowship, and deep love mean for us with God and with one another. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, you know better than we that words cannot begin to declare your glory. Still we try. Still we offer to you our praise and adoration. Still we pour out our love for you. 
So take our words and magnify them, amplify them, bring order to them, and harmonize them with your glory and your will. We pray that our words and our ways will be wed in a sacred effort of joyful obedience, just as Jesus demonstrated. And rain down on us your blessing so that we might rise up and bear the fruit of faithfulness as living vessels of your steadfast love. And may the love we know through the power of the Holy Spirit be our living creed as we bear witness in a wounded, weary, and fearful world of suspicion, hostility, and despair. You have heard the cries of the marginalized, the oppressed, the broken, the hungry, and the lost. You've declared the value of each woman, man, and child, and all of creation. You have established your justice and knit it into the human heart and into the cosmos. You have not left us in the darkness of our idolatry, but you have led us with the light of truth, and you have atoned for our willful disobedience, welcoming prodigal daughters and sons home with blessing and celebration. As we observe the sacrament of this table, may our baptism be remembered and renewed. May our fellowship be enriched, and may our resolve to live as disciples be a testimony of your love revealed in Jesus, in whose name we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was gathered with his disciples for the Passover, this was the third time he had come to Jerusalem with his disciples to celebrate remembering God's mighty act of deliverance from oppression and oppressors. And so they were gathered there, and he blessed the bread as we have done in his name. And he took it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, the body of Christ. And in the same manner also, after they had supped, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the remission of sin. The cup of salvation. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth and to all Christians throughout all time and space that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do so in remembrance of Christ's atoning death until he comes again in glory. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, as we have supped at this table, your table, your meal, May we be nourished by the holy food of your love, your blessing, your will. And may we go from this table nourished and enriched and empowered to live demonstrative lives of sacrifice and love, seeking your justice, bearing witness to those who are marginalized and broken, speaking truth to power. All these things we lift up to you and to your glory. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.
beloved ones, God is calling us to go deeper, to go farther in prayer, in Bible study, financial generosity, creativity, connectivity, relationships, witness, service, and faith. God is calling us out of the shallow, shallows and inviting us to go boldly into the depths and let down our nets for a catch beyond measure. May we go together. May we go with courage. May we go in grace. Amen.